And so when I was eight years old, I was living in the U.S. on the East Coast, and I was with parents who were neglectful and abusive. That exposed me to a lot of pedophiles and a lot of other unsafe adults. One of those adults spotted me as a, you know, a child that I wasn't really uh, being protected, and he chose to abduct me. And he took me out of the country. Keep in mind, it's 1977. It's post-Vietnam War. So as best as I can remember, he drugged me, and he actually put me in a duffel bag. I went through his, his personal luggage that he carried with him. Um, when I became conscious, I was in a, in a small apartment, and he was there, and I kind of came to figure out when we went outside that it was a military base, and he was in uniform. My life was in danger at every moment. Um, he did assault me and break my ribs. Um, it was actually a neighbor that saved him from basically killing me that way. And I was hospitalized. No one stopped him from coming to get me. So he just walked in, you know, said he was my dad and, and took me. So he took me to a, a place where it was a market. And it was the first place I actually realized we were in Africa because before on the military base, I didn't actually see that many people of color. And in the market, it was mostly black. So he actually abandoned me at that point. He gave me over to another man and then just drove away. It was incredibly mixed because on the one hand, I just lost the worst, most dangerous enemy to me in the world. On the other hand, he was the only one who knew where I came from. I had this, you know, at least a fantasy that he was going to be the one to get me back home. And so with him abandoning me, I thought, how, how am I ever going to get home now? Because I don't know the way. So what happened next is I went with the new man. He was black African. And we got on an old bus and went a ways. And then the bus broke down. And we were all instructed to get off and walk. But I had broken ribs, I hadn't been fed, and I couldn't keep up. And so he also abandoned me. And what it's important to understand is this is 1977 in Rhodesia, that's now Zimbabwe, and it's the height of the Rhodesian War. And there's three factions, and one of them, the extremists, one of their tactics is to kill white children so that the white farmers will leave and that they can have their land back. So for me to be abandoned out in this rural area is a matter of hours for my survival. So a middle party soldiers picked me up and took me to a village that I'm assuming they think would be receptive to a white child. And also it was closer to the border to South Africa. And so these people took me in. It was a rural village and they, they took me in. And, and what's so profound for me in that part is I came from not having mothering. I, I did not have, my mother wasn't capable of that. Now I know that there's many African cultures that it's normal for them to mother a child that's not their biological child. That sometimes they will take their sister's child into their home and then raise them as their own. That's normal in many African cultures. So what's exceptional is that they did that for a white child during a war where it was very dangerous for them to have me. And what I understand now that I've gone back is they could have been accused of abducting me, which would have been a very serious crime. So it was a very big risk for them to take me in. And that they really brought me in with the singing and the ceremony. And it really just filled me up. I was so hungry, I was so broken, I was just like a wounded animal. And to have one of the women sing to me and then hold me into her arms, I literally just collapsed in her arms and just let her be my shelter and let her be my new mother. So I um, went to the creek and was playing by myself. And I looked up and there was a soldier and he pulled out his rifle. And when the rifle became just a circle, then I knew I was done for. So he pulled the trigger and the bullet grazed the top of my head and it blew me off my feet and I started to die of blood loss. And what happened when I first crossed over is that I was greeted by two black women and they felt like my two big sisters, and that they were there to greet me and to take care of me. And they gestured to a really big uh, glowing orb, like a sphere. And I knew I could go into that and I would be fully restored. But I was so attached to that, I had just finally found family. And so I really wanted to stay with them. And that confusion sent me backwards and away from these two sisters. And then I went through a dark cave where I really had to purify my self-blame about being abused, the part of me that thought something was wrong with me. That's why adults abused me. And my guide really helps me see that 
there was nothing wrong with me and that the abuse wasn't my fault. And we made it through that dark cave and I went to a field and there I met a being. He was uh, had a beard and a robe with kind of long sleeves that was kind of felted material. And he had a sheep herder staff. And in his presence, I felt no disturbance because I was still longing to get back to my African family. When I was looking at trying to figure out who he was, his face changed to a lion. But oh, I want to show this to Atto, who was one of the men in the village. And then his face changed to Atto. And so he was showing me it's not the form that matters, it's the connection. And then he leaned his forehead to mine, and I could see as he sees, which is that we're all connected by these living lines, like golden spider webs, and that in each of us there's a gem, sparkling gem. So I saw this huge matrix of all these gems, and these living lines of connection, and that we can strengthen those living lines with our focus and our love. And then he brought his four back from mine, and my faith in him, my trust in him, was so absolute that I just leaned my whole being into his. And we traveled and we came out above the scene where I had died. And so the African woman who was like a mother to me, she had found my body and she was stopping the blood flow and she was wailing. And I wanted her to know I'm okay. I'm loved, I'm taken care of, I'm totally guided, I'm not in pain, and I'm just fine. I went further into the tunnel and there was more beings that purified me and I knew that I was going home. And home felt to me like my words for it are the great heart. And that that was the original place where I was sung into being, that I started as a sound sung by the great heart. And so I was going home to that place of origination. But I heard the song of my African mother, and it was so pure that I stopped to listen. And when I listened, it awakened my memory that I hadn't done my purpose which was to also be part of the medicine singers like she is. And that I too was to sing to people to help them remember themselves. And that desire to live that purpose is what turned me around the tunnel. And I turned away from, you know, going towards unification and total purity and came back. And as I started coming back, I thought, I'm not sure I made the right choice. I'm getting pain. I'm getting body sensation. And, and I'm remembering what's back there, but I already made my choice. So it was like a, like a river kind of moving me out. And so I came back to my body and my African mother was like this great protector. I felt so fragile. And so they took care of me for many days and I was starting to recover and be able to get up a little bit. Um, and so what happened next is that the soldiers came back and attacked the village. And so one of the other mothers, I was in a hut with her, and when she thought everything was done, she grabbed me and started to run, and I was on her hip. Where unfortunately, they were still there, and so the um, bullets came from the right side and hit her, and I was on her left side, so I was protected. And so she went down, and, and I, once I recovered from falling down with her, I thought, well, I have to drag her with me, and, but she was yelling at me just to go. And she had never yelled at me before. And so I was totally torn, like, I'm eight, I'm very weak, I'm not sure I can pull her. And she was yelling at me and giving me this command to go. So I followed her command. And I ran and I could only make it so far, my blood pressure, of course, was so low. And so I almost made it to the trees near the Limpopo River before I collapsed. So I, so I crossed over and had an entirely different experience. It was a white and blank, and there was just a little horizon line. And there was um, a song being sung to me on that horizon line. And it was literally like Sesame Street where the, the words, you will live. And there was actually even just like Sesame Street, a blue bouncing ball. And so the song being sung to me, you will live. And so it's to the rhythm of three by mice. And that was a very positive memory for me because one time when I was sick, Kind of the most loving thing my brother ever did to me was sit down when I was really sick and read me the whole set of Three Blind Mice. And so when I was able to see through the veil, what I saw was a 
a man and he was, his skin tone was kind of a very blue, purple blue, it was very beautiful. Um, and he was jeweled and he had um, black hair that was up in a bun on the top of his head. And so he kind of was feminine and masculine at the same time, but really intensely powerful. And it wasn't soft and loving like the experience I had with the man in the field where I just felt completely embraced. It was intense. And I felt like he had the power to make a mountain with his hand and destroy the mountain two seconds later with his hand. And that I knew he was telling me I was going to live because he chose it as part of a greater cycle. And that if he wanted it that I was destroyed and made into a new form, that, that would be also. But he was choosing for me to live because there was some reason that that was going to help in the, some big cycle that I couldn't possibly understand. And his message to me is destruction makes available the ingredients for new creation. That we must break this apart, just like a mountain is made and then it comes down with erosion to make the beach. And you can't have the beach without the mountain being worn down. When I came back out of that experience, he was still with me and he commanded me to move forward. Because I just wanted to give up. I had just lost everyone I loved. I felt absolutely horrible. I saw no way I was going to make it because I lost the people who took care of me. And he commanded me to move forward to the nearest well. Literally, I crawled for the whole rest of the evening until it was dark towards this well because he commanded me to move every inch forward. And the next day I was found by a woman from another village. And she washed me off and muddled me up and took me back to her homestead. And when people saw that she had a wounded white child, they said, don't bother with her, it's too dangerous. And she said, she's a living human being, I'm not gonna throw her away. In hindsight, in the perspective I have now, in the research I've done now, I wonder, was that Shiva? When people have the idea of people's near-death experiences are influenced by their beliefs, on the one hand, I get that and I understand that. I wasn't raised Christian, and I certainly wasn't exposed to anything Hindu. And so, you know, by my perspective now, that man in the field was Jesus, and then I meet Shiva. How did that happen? East Coast white girl in Africa. It wasn't in India, I was in Africa.